All right. Welcome, everyone, to another Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord Q&A. Our guest today is Tim Adelin. Or how, how do you pronounce your name, your last name, Tim? Adelin. Adelin. Thanks. For, Adeline. Adeline. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Tim. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So, so Tim is a philosopher interested in the art of transformation. He's the owner of the Voicecraft Collective website and podcast. So, Tim, so you jo you actually joined our forum uh, a little while ago, and thank you for that. Uh, what, maybe you could tell mm. us a little bit about yourself and your background, and uh, you know what what's brought you into this whole sphere of the the internet that we find ourselves in. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. I mean, definitely feeling that energy as well. I'm just <laughs> smiling. Um, yeah. Well, look. I mean, I think possibly like most everyone here, I'm here because I was following questions and an embodied sense and need ultimately for meaning <laughs> in life to do something with it that was valuable to make sense of it in a way that afforded me to do meaningful and valuable things and fundamentally that seems to be nested in a sense of love which is somehow unasked and unasking i haven't used those words before to describe it but th things seem to ground out in just a fundamental affirmation of being and then you sort of have to work up like what the fuck are we all doing here like can we do things that are helpful or not um and that journey goes back a long way so you know like everyone begins begins well in the womb fundamentally and you can speak about it from like a Stanislav Grof perspective, which I think is quite interesting, the perinatal matrices of these stages of the birthing process, which have arguable effects on the dynamics of the psyche as it f unfolds throughout life. But we're all used to talking about things in sort of developmental terms, like how we were when we were children, what opportunities were afforded to us, what kind of traumas we experienced, what things we were able to learn and, and how we came to mature. And so the story begins there for me. Um, but skipping a whole way down, look, I mean, John Viveki, his work, I think is fantastic. And his pedagogy is as good as his work, which is also fantastic. And he was someone whose ideas I came into contact with in around 2014, 2015. And I found that it was a, a bit of a refuge point, or at least knowing that there was a... Um, not that I was looking for scientific explanations, and of course there are limits to what John is really even looking for science to achieve regarding at least relevance. Obviously he thinks we can have a science of relevance realization. But it was, it was like a, um, a bit of a, a lighthouse for me in the world of institution, um, because I never really found any professor in my years of studying at different universities. So I did a bachelor in philosophy and in international relations and a master's in philosophy, which I almost failed and, um, you know, took many years to complete because I was pursuing independent research that was basically stemming from an interest in psychedelics and um, a dissatisfaction with the state of philosophy of mind. So taking the hard problem very seriously, but feeling that from within analytic philosophy, essentially everyone is basically inequipped to actually integrate the quality of consciousness with theory building there's something too disembodied about the whole project and doesn't make appropriate doesn't come into appropriate relationship with the mystical um to say nothing of to say little say nothing of that i mean people are still hung up on the quality of the color red you know obviously that they're, they're, they're looking for that as an example of qualia just kind of like a base feel of consciousness and what it is to be like but I always just felt, man, there's this, <laughs> what it is to be, is to be in, in enmeshed in, in continued quality. And, um, and I just felt that in sort of in keeping with the breakdown of teacherly authority in institutions writ large, um, in keeping with the kind of uh, senescence and inadequacy of our institutions, writ large and our perhaps our culture writ large elements of it you know not meaning to be flippant about that i felt as though the only way i could ever kind of have the conversations i wanted to have and the only way i could 
feel to contribute in a way that felt appropriate was to undergo some process of creating a table even as I spoke at it. So um, there just wasn't really a place to, to be, to have the kind of conversations I wanted to have. Now, I said, you know, John's work was kind of like a lighthouse and it was one of the few places it was, but, you know, I'm not from Canada and um, my life didn't quite take those turns. So um, as far as the podcast goes, you know, um, that's been a journey of three, three and a half years, a bit longer, and it is has been an attempt really from the beginning to have the kind of conversations that now are referred to as the kind of dialogos conversations. I'm still a bit sort of hesitant about using that language myself because I think it has sort of sacred connotations and also, um, you know, it's been largely, it wouldn't, it wouldn't say it's been defined precisely, but it's being discussed and enacted um, in environments that I'm often not a part of. And so I feel like, well, to say I'm doing that thing might be not that helpful in some sense, but fundamentally as a placeholder term, it seems like that's kind of what it's about. So here we are, you know, I'm just keen to have a chat with you guys and um, whether this is a Q&A or just an opportunity for us all to talk together, um, you know, I'm equally interested. So it's really nice to, to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, great. We're, we're so happy to have you. So, so, you said a, a, a lot there, you know, as you're a philosopher, I'd like to throw out three words, you know, simple words or, or not so simple and, and get your, your take on them. And, and these are words that you've, you've said just now and that we speak a lot of, but these words are meaning, love and sacred. How, how do you frame those, those words? What, what does meaning mean to you? Um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think we probably all use that word to mean like 10, 100 million different things. Um, so it, it often kind of depends what mode of communication I'm engaging in. I communicate to myself quite differently when I'm writing. Um, and that's mainly to myself. It's not designed always to be that way. But I find that the expression that comes out when I'm trying to be absolutely clear with language is not that exceptionally translatable to speaking uh, it would sound disjointed and technical but what would i mean i would mean something meaning as in one sense you can i take it at least as kind of a um a, a term that gestures or references at the a, a kind of nebulous affectation um a quality type dynamic which is inherently a relational so i want to say process as i want to say unit like a little thing but it's not a thing it's a dynamic relation so in the sense of john talking about the transjectivity and meaning being a uh, sort of a dynamical relation sort of realized through a reciprocal relationship between agent and arena so it's a kind of it's a kind of fluid coupling affectivity um, it exists in this transjective place, which isn't a place, it's a duration that we participate in. Um, so like what, so, I mean, in philosophy, people talk about in intentionality. There's a discourse about intentionality in the philosophy of mind, which is how, how do our words or how do our gestures or how do our signs come to have kind of, how do they map onto things? How do we actually map onto the world? What, what do our words what gives them the quality of their meaning? How do we get to actually pick something out? And um, so it's, it's partly something like that as well, like what enables us to differentiate between what are many, many meanings or so much information. Um, I mean, spoken about kind of in that way, it's almost a bit amorphous, right? It's kind of like, everything's meaning but then we differentiate and there's perhaps a hierarchy of meaning um but maybe that's not the right word to use we realize some meanings as more relevant than others and undergoing these processes like for john obviously backed on underground like the underground of it is that relevance realization up and down the stack of different kinds of knowing and perception um 
we come to differentiate um, and integrate and altogether build a world and enact ourselves in a world that is coherent or more or less coherent. Um, so the meanings form some kind of picture or perhaps story, but not just a story. It's got, it's, you know, it depends what you mean by story, but it's the kind of constituent elements of what enables really things to make sense to us, something like that. Um, that's not really much of a definition, definition, is it? But it's sort, sort of like images that come to mind. As far as sacred and love, I mean, I, I, I do tend to think that Forrest Landry's phrase, uh, love is that which enables choice, is a really beautiful, um, uh, uh, non-lossless compression of some deeply important notions. So love being, for me, love is something which both enables our um, appropriate attachment and appropriate detachment. So love is something that uh, can let go as well as um, be in intimate, proximal touch with, um, which is a, a quite remarkable thing um, that we can both love something and let it go. So there's an enabling there. Love is something that is inherently enabling of the other. Um, and so for Forrest, love is that which enables choice. That choice, in his view, you know, is, and in mine too, really, is, is fundamental, um, at least to the lives of human beings. We could speak about it metaphysically, perhaps. Um, not that it, that, you know, he, he has choice, change, and causation at the same level together, but choice is involved, inherently involved. Um, and so to enable choice is to basically grant the dignity to another to realize and walk their own path, you know, even as we are inherently in relationship with each other on our many varied paths and sacredness would be i think that reality we participate in that enables our paths to cohere together and be in relationship to the whole fundamentally which to me is a whole making because the paths are always to be walked and we are in relationship with potential or novelty and so the whole is something that's dynamically changing and we are involved in the choices we make um, to uh, enable or not that whole making. So, yeah, meaning, love, the sacred. That's like uh, pretty some beautiful, beautiful concepts. I hope some of that landed in interesting ways. Yeah, uh, definitely. Do you do you think we've done a disservice in modern English? by combining the different types of love to one word as opposed to agape and philia and eros? I mean, it's pretty remarkable we have language at all. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's it, like every day something gets revealed to me in conversation with someone where people take a word. I was talking to a guy um, yesterday and we were playing a game called the glass bead game, which I'll tell you about a little bit if you like. Um, sure. And he, we were talking about the relationship between masters and slaves. Um, and he was using a metaphor of a, of a boat and he, in a kind of just an improvised state of being, he made the link between, you know, masters are able to sort of raise their masts and sail away to play other games. And I'd never even thought about the word mast as in ship, you know, um, part of a ship being part of the word master before and i was just like man that's so that's so awesome and these words are always nested inside each other like um nowhere just put those together or oh, sorry you have now and here it's like stuff like that just blows my mind all the time um you know it's a bit you know kind of like cereal box wordplay etymology in some sense but then at another level i'm like man these things are so interested how we've retained the clues there and the meanings there so yeah for sure, there's different kinds of love. Um, but then I also think that 
because we enact these different kinds of love all the time, I mean, to the extent we are sort of in right relationship with each other, then it's not as though I'm not convinced that meanings are lost from us. And of course, when someone comes along and, you know, partitions up or tells us about different senses of a word, we're like, oh, yeah, that's that thing. And that's that thing. And that's that thing. And so the language is very helpful for that. And it can open up pathways of expression. But, you know, my parents, for instance, you know, couldn't tell you about the Greek words for love. But when I was a young child, they certainly treated me with one kind of love and not another. And so in that sense, um, how much have we forgotten? In one sense, a lot, but then in another sense, not much. I'm not trying to make much of a point here. It just comes to me that um, I am quite interested in how we can open ourselves to things we're already doing and practices we engage in, which in some sense have many of the answers we are already looking for. Um, but yeah, I mean, for sure, we are fairly blunt instruments in many ways. And um, there's a lot more complexity than we often speak to. Just want to ask one more question before I move to questions from the from the members. So, so you describe yourself as being interested in the art of transformation. So what is the art of transformation? What, what makes it an art and transforming into what? Well, the transformation is ongoing in some sense. Well, in, in a genuine, a real sense. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, where is it going would speak to the question in some sense of teleology which you touched on before we got into this chat um but you know it's kind of funny the things we write about ourselves when we do little bios i i absolutely fucking hate them um <laughs> I, I truly hate them and i i i the only reason i put anything at all is because i feel like i have to and um i do want to engage with people and i'm quite serious about the project and all of this so I want to kind of share, you know, see sort of ideas about myself, but that, that, that ultimately attract people to collaborate with me, engage with me who might be interested in similar things. So definite pinch of salt, hey, but the art of transformation. Well, when it comes to art, we're not trying to create something final and correct and absolutely certain exactly um there's a sense in which it's a continued pursuit of beauty in in one way you know the, I, I don't think i can quite speak to the the wonder of art uh, exhaustively but um basically what do i mean by it like I'm quite interested and very much committed to living in a way that's um, less fucked than I could, um, but said in a way that was trying to, you know, sound smart in some sense to, to live in a beautiful way, to enter into beautiful relationships, to build beautiful things. Um, and we are always transforming, you know, life is transforming in my own writing. These things are sort of nested inside a, domain which I personally reference as loving transformation. Um, I just can't make sense of how uh, game making at all can occur without that which is able to both sort of affirm a game and also let it go and recreate. So um, to have faith in some sense of the continuity of worthwhile being through losses or through death or um, um, through transformation itself, which, you know, involves cycles of death from, from a, some perhaps even not so metaphorical perspective. You know, we build things and have to let them go. We, um, we build relationships and they uh, serve us to a certain point in time. And unless we, unless that relationship transforms, uh, it could be something detrimental to the flourishing of both individuals, for example. So how to change, how to develop appropriately, how to 
um, enter into more loving relationships, be more available to right action in the world. It means all of that kind of thing to me. We, we've been, we talk a lot about transformation here and we've been playing with trying to insert some, you know, s symbols and ritual and I think we tentatively come up with the concept of the role of aspirant, uh, which is, you know, where it would be more than just becoming a member here. You would sort of declare yourself an aspirant, declare yourself that you're look, seeking to transform. You're, you're, you aspire to mm. transform. You aspire to, you know, engage in this, the ecology of practices and, and to, to take part in this, in this process. So I, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, but we we have to. Um, I mean, uh, it's kind of funny, you know. Um, I don't know if you guys ever have this experience where you might be asking yourself to do something or committing yourself to do something, but until it arrives at a certain place of expression, if I just keep the idea in my mind say all right i'm not going to have another cookie today but i don't properly even form it with with thought in a way or it gets it's like it, like it reaches a, a state in consciousness where i i could just it's right there to be said and it's helpful if i say it but i find that that voice can exist with the same kind of force and meaning just inside consciousness but there's somewhere before it gets to that where i'm aware of it but i haven't quite committed to it and unless i do you know, the chances are I'm going to have another cookie. So, you know, we have to kind of commit to things and in making those commitments to each other. I think I've heard John speak about that in making commitments to each other. We're afforded the opportunity to come to know ourselves a bit more. Definitely seems to be the case. I'd like to move to questions from the from the members. So, Struan, you, you have a question. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Hello. Um, so I was wondering, um, since you recently interviewed Anderson Todd, um, I was wondering whether you might have seen the conversation Anderson had with John Vivekey, where he suggested to John that alchemy was a proto-cognitive science. If you have, do you have any thoughts to share on them? Yeah, um, I did listen. I think I probably listened a few times. Um... I'll be honest with you. I'm not entirely sure what science is. Um, I, my sense of science is that even when we choose between scientific theories for their accuracy or for their validity or their strength or plausibility, even, I mean, even those things in, in just me trying to reference that concept, we have these different markers of what constitutes good science. So people talk about measurability and repeatability as being, you know, fundamental. And that seems to me like a good philosophy of science. Um, but, you know, people also talk about elegance. Um, and then they talk about, you know, um, sort of predictive validity and if something can be falsified and, you know, how well can it be ob observed and pr properly measured? And, well, I guess I would be... I would, I would be more sort of, let's say interested, because I'm interested to talk to you about it, but I would sort of like to invite, you know, Anderson to expand on what he sort of takes science to be. Now I said, say proto-cognitive science, so that is kind of limiting the claim proto being like sort of some kind of stage before not yet sort of fully formed but kind of heading in that direction it's kind of like the the, the building blocks well of. I, I suppose if i can clarify that slightly what i'm when i say proto-cognitive science what i'm trying to say is do you believe that there's uh validity towards the claim that that um within alchemical text there's genuine information with respect to our psychological states and how to actually manipulate Yeah. Yeah. I do think that. I think that we can come to 
increasing awareness of what is present in consciousness and where our attention is being drawn so you know what is um, salient to us what is populating our salience landscape am i you know it's 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 interesting i have to sort of take myself into quite a lived place to begin to talk about this sort of stuff because what is correct correct me if i'm wrong but what's kind of really being asked is for us to step into a state of consciousness where we are present with um kind of potentially very volatile states of consciousness so a stage in the alchemical process would be i mean god they have the they have the 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 um the fire so what's that cow i forget the, i forget the word uh, i think it's calcination calcination yeah so they have the calcination they have sublimation they have um uh dissolution they have um um, the recoagulation so that so that so the kind of letting go the differentiating the dissolving and the building back up and various ways of entering these kind of states so the other day uh, it was about 11 a.m oh, sorry 11 p.m and i felt as though i needed to move quite a bit of energy so i smoked um quite a lot of weed and i don't often do that um, but I do do it when I feel like I could benefit from spending some quite intense time moving energy. And what that feels like is basically an array of visionary type experience where all the while identity itself is sort of shifting. So it's not clear exactly where i am i should be holding my ground so you want to be quite careful about your your safety in some sense with that you've got to have a it helps to have a, a capacity to really tune in and check in with the breath and be in touch with one's body to be safe but it's a kind of helpful process for surfacing narratives ideas fragments of relationships with people, commitments you've made, things you haven't done, things you've been pushing away, things you've forgotten. And there's so much material that is sort of being broken up and presented. And well, what do we make of that? How do we, how do we orient in that space? What is, what does it become appropriate then to congeal together, right? Finding continuity in that. Who am I in that? How do I like, for example, in constructing this sentence right now, I mean, because I'm not that good at doing this, I try to be better, but maybe what I'm saying is not that interesting to some people. Some people are kind of not following. This thing is not making sense, but maybe there's a few people where it's like, oh, there's something there you're trying to speak to and I'm kind of getting it and it's kind of interesting. Well, what is that process? What is that process? Like we're on some, it's like we're tending to a channel of communication what are we tending to it for? Um, well, we're trying to seek and understand things. I mean, we have a broad sense of the, a game we're playing somehow, and that game's nested in other games. And we want to sort of develop ourselves such as to um, play more appropriately within a particular game, perhaps transform it so it might come into a better relationship with other games. Like, you know, these things all come back to what do we care about at all? And that's partly a question of identity. Like, who am I? Uh, what is mine to do? Um, these are sort of being temporally bounded in some sense. Um, but then in another sense, how do we engage in a process which enables us to change artfully in a kind of continuity relationship with a set of values uh, or virtues which essentially consist in that which enables us to continue to play and remake games? So... So does alchemy offer a kind of toolkit for um, mapping or characterizing how 
we can come to know ourselves, engage in the processes of transformation within. Um, he, he described it to me as cooking with being, Anderson did. And he also described alchemy, in fact, as the art of transformation. Um, yeah, well, I, so, I agree with that very, very much. Um, in my opinion, the philosopher's stone can be thought of as a symbol for self-organizing criticality. And that, that's the way mm -hmm. that I generally approach it. Uh, mm -hmm. But everything else that you said ties in a lot with, with that, I think. Um, you know, the, the, the process of, of uh, what is it, uh, led to gold, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, but that, that spiritual, if you take it in a, transforma in, a, in a spiritual sense, then yes, it does very much speak to a personal transformation where you're trying to bring the elements together in order to make the great work. Yes. I mean, yes. And then what are those? So we bring those elements together so that Philosopher's Stone is a self-organizing criticality, the self-making criticality. But then so fascinatingly, like the, the distinction between the internal and the external is also blurred in this way of thinking. Um, and certainly from a perspective of process philosophy, philosophy and, and the kind of and or the Jungian depth psychological approach, we have this, you know, the council within the system within and then the the system without um the council without so this self-organizing criticality to me this this is properly seen as also in relationship with the self-organizing criticalities of other people which themselves coagulate and differentiate and integrate into systems which demonstrate the same kind of self-making like have to demonstrate the same kind of self-making behavior at least insofar as it enables any of thing any of this to continue so self yeah, how can we be self-making together C can you yeah, just clarify like what a self-organizing critical criticality is um well john spoke about that during his awakening from the meaning crisis the lecture series um in nature things are self-organizing which means fundamentally that um like a tornado is self-organizing that the, the the processes that lead towards a tornado will um, reinforce the tornado's existence so it will spin faster and faster and faster until it gets to a point where eventually entropy takes over and the entire system collapses um, natural systems follow that process very much where they um, and living systems especially um, follow that and i've um, uh, there's research to show that the brain um, actively seeks out self-organizing criticality where um, information the theory is that information processing maximizes on the on the line that is the border between order and chaos and so what the philosopher's stone here would would be signifying is the border that's on the on the line between order and chaos sorry the line that's on the border between order and chaos um, and then so the way that I look at it from an alchemy perspective is that the, the philosopher's stone you're supposed to get the philosopher's stone but the, the but the philosopher's stone isn't the end it's the means and then so like the philosopher's stone is understanding self-organizing criticality but then you've got to take that understanding and apply it to the world and understand that there's all these other self-organizing criticalities which you have to interface with and so that to me is like what the what the whole alchemist association with self-organizing criticality would be in terms of trying to get the two languages to speak together the scientific and the and the psychological let's say yeah i think that's a nice articulation um I have thought a few times in response to John speaking about this self-organizing criticality. I can't remember exactly, but I thought he differentiated between the self-organizing and the self-making in some sense, so that a tornado doesn't seek out the conditions of its own making yeah, in the, the same the, way the living we system do. Has a yeah, the living system has a governor which which auto, which which seeks out the to to reinforce the the self-organizing criticality and and the 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 tornado would lack that. So it it has yeah. it's only while the environment enforces the the self-organizing criticality that the tornado continues to spin. But the living organism has something above that because it actually actively tries to prevent or or tries to intercede against environmental patterns which would disrupt the the self-organizing criticality. And I think John argues that parasitic processing is largely a result of the self-organizing criticality attempting to keep the, the environment at bay in, in this way. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. So a key, a key differentiating feature then to use some of the language that I've just brought in in this conversation would be the self-making 
process is actually capable of of uh, creating new games. It can, yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, um, and that would sort of take me to where, like, mostly where I'm at at the moment is how can we make new games together? Um, yeah, well, I, think... I would say that that's the. Uh, the the love and the creativity and the and the ability to make choices that that's where it all comes from right yeah 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 exactly so we have to kind there's a kind of like a a baseline what's the minimal viable but necessary well it's a, it's a kind of necessary i mean to speak of sufficiency is also to speak of kind of like if we actually have the actuation potential to get up off our backsides and be able to do anything at all so maybe sufficient there's another couple things but what are kind of the core necessary features of what characterizes the right relationship of coming into like building games with other players so dignifying the the player like capacity in others um so there's a kind of dignity there and there's got to be an integrity of that communication channel. Um, and then there's a, a kind of directionality, um, as far as I can tell, which I think is something like Forrest talks about life lived well and fully. Um, and so just, obviously we could mean a lot of different things by that, but a kind of a directionality of a kind of a flourishing development, although the word flourishing, I sometimes tend to stay away from, but that's probably just due to silly bias reasons and sometimes frustration with Sam Harris a little bit, even though I do respect him as a person. Um, but yeah, how do we, what are the kind of the minimal viable um, virtues, axioms that enable the right relationship of game making together? Um, seems to be a very ripe inquiry. I don't know what you think about that. Uh, I think that that sounded to me just like the application form to the religion that's not a religion section of the server. It sounds like you've got mm -hmm. a lot to say, and I think that you should very much be part of that conversation because, yeah, that, that's basically what we're all interested in as well. So, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, I mean, yeah, so I I would like to be part of that conversation. Um, we can talk about We can talk about that afterwards, if you like. It would sort of come down a little bit to a kind of, uh, well, actually a, a rational structuring of all of our energies fundamentally, which would be to engage in the discussion. Um, a lot of it is where to engage in the discussion. And I'm also trying to think. Yeah, well, we've got a design of... document and, and kind of everything at the moment. So, I mean, yeah, th those questions are exactly the right questions, I think. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. All right, then, well, we can we, we can pick this back up. Um, we can pick this back up. Uh, yeah. Tim, sure, I'm not sure if it's just me, but... I'm not seeing your video. Maybe you could click it on and off, or is it just me? Can other people see uh, your vi his video? I see him fine. Uh, so maybe it's just me. It's a little choppy. I can see. It might just be you. Um, I okay. can't see. <laughs> All right. So it's some of us. Yeah, my video is definitely. All right. So yeah. okay, that's just. I, me. I'll try turning it off and on. Let's have a look. Sure. Let's see if that, that that brings you back. Oh, yeah, I can see you now. Great. All right, uh, Lord Doctor Doom. You have a hopefully not too doomful question. Ooh, maybe I should have come up with a doomful one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, in your study of philosophy, what's your favorite existential idea from a, a playful perspective, uh, like an integrating into the being mode? And then the same question, but for John's work. So what's your favorite existential idea in general? And what's your favorite existential idea from John's work? Hmm. Favorite existential idea. So an uh, example would be like agape, where it's like you get into the the loving state where you afford the yeah, other person yeah. a sense of possibility and growth in a positive direction. Like that would be an existential idea. All right. Well, the non-John's work one. Um, so Sartre said, existence precedes essence meaning that um we have to make our meaning fundamentally right there's not anything like prescribed in our beingness itself which um is <laughs> is like there for us already um and i this is not one of my favorite ideas i don't i don't agree with this precisely but it's playful um because I remember just consistently 
thinking about this. Our existence precedes essence, or essence precedes existence. How do we... But the, the, the playfulness is in the, 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 the kind of act of being itself. And we seem to we take in perception and then we spin it around and we come out with expression and we're consistently undergoing this process. And so it's a kind of rejection of the fixed frame of reference as being able to appropriately characterize meaning at all. So Sartre would be about then, you know, how do we respond to this thrownness that we find ourselves in kind of unmoored from a prescribed meaning in life and we have to go out and kind of make it um i mean it's been a while since i've read this stuff i'm probably butchering it but <laughs> but actually our capacity to make you know what i mean our capacity to make and to show up and to engage in anything at all is indicative of a capacity to do just that and it's never been anything but that but that is not a reduction of it away it's contemplating it from a different set of axioms that is much more fluent with a process type thinking and understanding ourselves as embedded relations within embedded relations that are nevertheless influential on that flow hmm. so we're involved in our meaning making and that is a real relationship in the in the world but it's a real relationship with the world um so uh, in terms of John's work, in terms of existential ideas of John's work, it's hard because there's so much of the architecture of his teaching that has been so influential on me. I wouldn't know exactly where to pick out one particular thing. Um, it's... What I'm about to say is altogether too sweet but what what john embodies and enacts in his way of dialoguing with people um is exemplary of a kind of a more than existential idea because it's it's not just an idea in obviously propositional space it's a way of coming into relation with people which is you know he has a lot to teach and it's appropriate that we listen to him if we want to learn about things he's learned about, obviously, because we don't have that learning necessarily. And then once we do have it, we can talk about other things. But he has a way of, I think, um, opening up dialogue and being receptive to other perspectives while teaching, framing the conversation, teaching, and also maneuvering it um, in a way that I think is very positive as far as interaction on the public stage goes. And that seems to me like a very existentially important thing. Um, what would be the existential idea in that? That we're all fucking involved, right? That we actually all do matter and that we have to speak to each other's virtues. We have to, we have to resonate with each other's dignity you know, um, that we are all involved in coupling processes with reality and with each other. And that's deeply life affirming to me. Um, you know, there's other ways to get at these ideas. I don't think precisely that sense is, you know, I don't think, I don't think I learned that from John, but I think his exemplification of that in dialogue is deeply important um, given the lack of that in much public discussion around topics as important as you know god sacredness and the meaning of life i hope that wasn't a cop-out question i'm not good at picking out particular ideas <laughs> that's okay that was brilliant thank you <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna skip ahead a bit because i know Lorene has a 
has her own meeting starting in a, in a few minutes with authentic relating games. But so, Lorraine, you had a question. Hi, thank you, Brett. Uh, hi, team. It's good to see you also here in the A Week from Meeting Crisis. I've joined him yeah, in good to see you too. Yeah, voice craft, crafting. So, so what I w- wanted to ask is that what do you think is the this role of games when it comes to the art of transformation? So what is this game design? Or if you can say that in a metaphor, what does that look like? Well, if we put a tiny child out in a professional rugby pitch, that child is not going to have a good time. And even though ostensibly that child's being put out in a game, he's not really playing that game, right? He's just going to get trampled and he's not going to learn and it's going to be altogether a tragic thing. So we learn through playing games, i.e. I think those environments where the curious, um, playful spirit um, is actually able to explore and then receive feedback in a way that doesn't end all possibility of further feedback, right? Like, um, how can we come to understand what is in our zone of agency um, unless we come up to the edge of where that is, you know? Like when you're bundling or wrestling, you know, with a with a sibling or your parents when you're really young, you're kind of figuring out what is appropriate to touch and how hard to pull and all the rest of it. And through that process, you come to an understanding of what are the others like, but then also what effects you have. And it's not an actual fight to the death, which means that the process of learning can continue. So the importance of making games that, is is critical because games are the environments where we get to um, test ourselves, extend ourselves, play, um, and yeah, I mean, it's got to be something a bit more interesting I can add to that. Um, this is where serious play comes in? Yeah, yeah, serious play for sure. I mean... Um, it's got to, you know, it, the serious, serious play is, is, I suppose, how, how um, enabled. So you've got to have, so the serious play is obviously taking place in a setting, right? So it's, it's, these things have to happen all at once, which is kind of why I'm struggling to talk about it right now, because we're talking about making games and playing games well, and we have to play our way to making the games, but we are doing something that's quite different from ordinary game playing that's already being set out, because what we're doing is looking to push the boundaries of a whole set of different games interaction styles like um maybe i could give an example of how i'm thinking about what kind of games i would like to see played um in a way that invited actually viewing of them in a fashion that we currently have so not that i want to continue this spectacle of kind of passive absorption of information without a a deeper kind of participant sense of mattering to that process but what we see for example in the game of politics is a whole bunch of pretense on the outside and then kind of inner workings on the inside where the real games are being played regarding the manipulation of power and who's getting what and how to balance my resources fundamentally within games that we're not telling you about so there's a kind of we're on the outside of a bunch of games but we're playing a game through voting and through like not rebelling and only rioting so much or accepting more or less the prescriptions that come down to us um but there's a disconnect in authenticity there's a disconnect in our trust of the right relationship between all of these things um so i'm kind of interested in creating a space that 
you know, a, a bit like a bit like this in that, you know, the questions being asked are um, real, serious, deep questions. And either I have something interesting to say about it or I don't. And that whole process is going to be played out right before you. Um, so the kind of games I'm interested to see are ones where the absolute fullness of the perceptual matrix of self of a particular individual, which is a term from Forrest Landry's work, the absolute fullness of an individual's perception can be called, it, it can be called upon and offered in relationship in a particular game space. So in some sense, anything I have to give that's valuable, I can offer it, but what's required in order for that offering to be, um, what's required in order for it be sa to be safe enough for me to offer that in some sense. It's still gonna be a risk, but you know, ultimately we're offering things like the commitment of our person, you know, it's where this aspirant, you know, um, making a commitment to being here and showing up in a certain way. Um, basically, these are games to play. It's a commitment to game making over a long period of time are the kind of games I'm interested to see where we, where we have people entering into covenants with one another covenants together where we are committing to offer the fullness of what we can given the integrity of relationship is maintained such that our giving continues to be appropriate um this is all quite abstract it's, it's such it's such a difficult one because we're making the games at the same time as playing them well, one, um, one of the things I can't just Sorry, one of the things we're really interested on this forum is the creation of new serious play games of new rituals you know to go along with the religion that's not a religion or the awakening from the meaning crisis and and uh, we're going to be forming a committee soon to really you know start uh really continue working on these because we, we 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 we've already started so so your your input would would certainly be very welcome there as we continue to experiment in this in this regard have you heard of the glass speed game uh, only because somebody posted about it uh uh, on the forum yeah so, so. yeah lcc yeah um so the person who posted about that i've played a few um glass bead games with them and um we so we've committed to do so regularly and i i find them really awesome in many ways they are akin to what is already achievable in conversation itself um, but they provide a bit of structure. So the idea with the Glass Bead Gamers LCC has created it is that you can take either one to three or five minute turns or longer turns. You decide, begin with one, where for a minute, one essentially undergo like does a, a verbal contemplation um, relating to a particular theme or bead. And he's come up with a bunch. So one might be game, one might be um, um, the gift um, one might be love right there's a, and there's a chosen in um, particular ways um, and we sort of trade back and forth a flow of extemporaneous contemplation about that particular concept and the idea is to merge with the expression of the other not to deny one's own critical reflexi reflexivity of it, but to really deeply listen to it and then take on those themes and build them into one's own expression and explore these concepts. So this is a kind of practice that I personally find really interesting um, and might be something worth looking into. Yeah, there's a website for it as well. Um, Glass bead game. I don't know if it's glassbeadgame.com, um, but I can link it to the link it to the channel. Oh, great! Um, 
And, and yeah, I did see yeah. in, in the Share Your Content channel. Uh, I believe I believe it's there. Uh, yes, yeah, Glassbeat yeah, Games. I, I think it was dot com with an yeah, S on the end. LCC. Or, or, yeah, po posted about that. So, thank you for that, Mark. You have a question. Hey, Tim. Uh, I've been looking into this uh, situation that I've seen over the years around uh, transformation. And so there's a couple of problems tied up, in my opinion, with using transformation. As you sort of, I think you sort of alluded to this uh, earlier when talking about it, there, we seem to be using one word for a bunch of different methods or strategies or events that we refer to as transformation. So one might be just the transformation over time. And, you know, you could say, look, uh, if you do nothing, entropy. If you do something, risk, right? Um, and that, that's, that's non-negotiable. Uh -huh. um, but the, the most interesting form uh, uh, of transformation for what I'm trying to explore it, are these so-called transformative experiences. And they can happen a number of ways. And one of the things I've, I've been sort of uh, asking John about uh, is, you know, in meditation, you, you, can, you can hit these transformative experiences within the meditation that cause sort of these second order effects that people notice, right? Um, but it, they, they don't necessarily integrate back into your life. And I think the same is true with, with taking psychedelics. You can take a psychedelic, have a good trip, have a transformative trip, and yet they're the same person afterwards, except for the reference to that one time they had the transformative experience. And so, mm. th so there's two problems wrapped up here. One is, well, what, what do we actually call that, right? Because it, it seems like we need three or four words for different types of transformation. But, and, and, you know, if you have a comment on that, that's great. And if you don't, that's fine too, because I think it's a hard thing to sort of suss out. But more importantly, you know, what do we do with the transformations that we have, especially the sudden or, or I don't want to say sudden, the, the grand transformations, right? Those transformations where you're, where you're touching the ineffable, right? Where you see, you have a, a, a sight or, or an experience of the divine. And, 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 and how do you integrate that? Like, what, what do you need to do? Because I, I think this is the right conception, although I'm totally prepared to be wrong. I, I think you need to seed the ground so that when and if that happens, it integrates and changes you because it's not just about the quote transformation. It's about the transformation's effect through time into the current time because that there seems to be a difference there and again maybe this is wrapped up in the word and it's just like no i had an exp a, 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 a temporal experience right that that doesn't that doesn't go outside the window and and these other things that i'm talking about are actually sort of transformative right where they've changed me in some sense so mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to get your feel for that because i think that you might actually have a lot of uh, a lot to say on that that would be helpful to me yeah yeah i mean awesome questions uh i do have a lot to say on it i mean i just like to preface this for everyone listening i'm sorry if if this is not that coherent um but i do think i can say some things um i mean sort of what you're referencing is very relevant to everything we've discussed so far and it speaks to this um relationship between the player and the game you know you can have a you can take a wind you can look through a window you can feel a different way of being in the world for a short space of time and um, come back as it were to ordinary life and all the conditions that you were functioning in before are basically the same the games that you find yourself in all those stimulus response relationships you know the shared landscape of expectation that you shared with all your social relations and that you'd built into your own environment the way your objects in your house are arranged, the activities you're doing at work, your travel back and forth, all these patterns of behavior remain exactly the same. And those patterns of behavior are obviously, I mean, that, that is one's, you have to, be, you be your way there, right? You, you make them real again when you go and undergo those patterns. Now, there might be a real sense of dissonance one has when one returns to the life 
one had before, given this other experience one had seen, one had like peeked behind the veil, so to speak, and maybe uh, contemplated and, and saw into the arbitrariness of ways people were living, patterns of action people were engaging in. And what do you do with that? What do you do with that is the question. Well, the issue is that we're, of course, social creatures. You know, Jordan Hall likes to say with the expression, we're obligate tribal. Um, and when we're talking about this um, transformation through, you know, um, we're talking about the, the alchemical part of this conversation, coming into self-making or self-organizing criticality within, um, well, we're engaged in those processes without as well. And if the environment doesn't continue to afford an integration of that way of seeing um, into the relationality you have with yourself and those around you and the environment itself, well, then there's just straight up dissonance there. And it's, it's, it's pretty clear that um, lots of people have experiences which if they could have them in communities and embedded in, in environments, which enabled their continued integration of some of that experience um, would help to embed that microcosm of transformative moment you know you're talking about into um, a healthier macrocosm. And that's, you know, that's not to say anything unique at all, right? Like it's integration considered over time, given we're social creatures always in relationship as well, more than social, we're ecological creatures, right? We're in deeply involved in, in the world around us. Um, so the challenge we have is to, and of course, this is something this community is, is vectoring towards doing and is doing right now. It's like, how can we create the environments, the games as well, um, that we can begin to work with some of the experiences we have, some of the ways of feeling and being we realize as possible in certain peak states. How can we bring them into relationship such that they are um, what seen, valued, heard, but, but ultimately um, enter into a kind of a reciprocal construction type relationship with with the world so you know it's all well and good to have a kind of non-dual type experience of seeing the seeing in and out through everything <laughs> um, but if one comes back to you know a screaming household where the state of play had been to basically just project onto one another all the various inner maladies and frustrations with life one had had you know, not least of which are due to um, a sick game that we're all nested inside of, or sick games we're nested inside of, then there's going to be bloody dissonance, isn't it? It's not it's going to be bloody easy. So, um, you know, the, the, the trick is to fundamentally create, if you have no option, um, well, if you have no option, uh, that's almost like a strange thing to say, because I think fundamentally we actually do always have an option. But say we've got at least the capacity to carve out a little bit of space and time for ourselves to be in such that we can begin to express in a way that channeled that perception we had, that being we were able to take part in and realize ourselves as living. If we can channel that into expression that is seeking a kind of um uh a, a relate it's like you, the word humility is coming to me um how can we both with with courage and care for the process and those things together kind of mean you really, there's no point being courageous if you don't have a humility because you're just going to charge off and get yourself done in immediately so like what do i actually have to give here what can i manage to do where's my zone of proximal development where's that risk i can take that's appropriate um, but caring for that process, obviously, over a longer period of time. How can I begin to express and create for myself um, an outlet and a relationship with something that I've manifested into the world, which is like my own little portal through which to begin to enter into some kind of 
relationship of coherence with not to objectify the thing but to get some of that inner counsel having an opportunity to express themselves through a a channeled like because we take all this content all this maelstrom of content and possibility and somehow right now on the tip of my tongue these next words there's a it's coming out in some way and of course like what am i referencing a lot and it might not be clear but there's a sense in which there's an honest attempt to channel it in a way that's coherent in a way that allows a certain amount of clear light to transmit and then we can all partake in that light together and we can go back and forth so to create the medium of communication in one's own domain to whatever degree one can but then we've got to seek those relationships with other people and it's a project over a long periods of time um you know if you find yourself isolated when these when things happen and, and to be honest with you i've met lots of people who have profound experiences particularly with psychedelics without practices to integrate them with and by the way going back to the mat and meditating is going to be a way to integrate these things on a continued basis as well i'm not saying everything has to, but the, the outwardness of expression i personally think is quite important um but you know, I meet a lot of people who take psychedelics and have very powerful experiences, and it doesn't seem to do them any good apart from to um, hit them with a massive dose of deep dissatisfaction with everyone around them because they just can't find a way to um, express themselves in a way that is truly heard and um, that enters into a loving, constructive relationship with someone else. It's not an easy thing to do to speak about a lot of this stuff, given, I mean, as you were saying, we don't have the words to describe a lot of um, the con not only the content we experience, but fundamentally, the it's like a reorientation in, of mind. You know, we, we, we go from thinking about, it depends how seriously we take this whole cognitive grammar thing, right? <laughs> As John's, as John's always talking about how seriously we take the cognitive grammar that structures the flow of our expression fundamentally, but it structures it because it's also a perceptual lens through which we filter. It's part of that thing which filters perception through to expression. So it's 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 a kind of um, it can be parasitic in that transjective space. So we are creating the protocols and processes, communities relationalities games together where we can build together um, languages practices that enable the continued integration of some profoundly different states we can realize which seem ultimately to be clustered around the deeper senses of connectedness we can feel within and without and ultimately grounded in a kind of appreciation for the opportunity of life itself given the absurdity of the of the void you know that 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 there is something and it can be lived right that there that we can live at all given the kind of void of non-being which can be experienced in contrast it's just like an agonizing agonizing thing it's like man it's such a beautiful thing we can live and um um but 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 to but to then speak about how it is we can live over long periods of time given how powerful we are as a technological civilization now given the kind of evolutionary grammar and functioning we've hardwired into ourselves over thousands and thousands of years of fucking death <laughs> um it's like, man, that's a big, it's a big deal to turn all that stuff around. Um, so where does it, it come? It really comes back. I can't, you know, being here talking to each other is demonstrative of, you know, an honest attempt to engage in a kind of collaborative inquiry, a conversation, which hopefully can spark to that which we've experienced and those aspects of ourselves which are seeking to meet in a ground or in a space where they have time to be valued um, and that can't even be perceived at all um, we have to find find the people who are ready of their own sovereign discernment to 
create with and build with together um, and hold each other in integrity throughout that whole process. So, yeah, I think that's hopefully a bit of an, an answer. Yeah, actually, I found that very helpful. You touched upon a bunch of themes, and I think, I think, uh, I think, really, the the big answer I got out of that was it the transformative experiences where you're in touch with the ineffable. We should just call those profound experiences and solve that problem that way, and then we should deal with why we're engaging in profound experiences that we're unable to. I want to say, take back with us from that place back into the place where we are. And so that would be the problem. This creates a bunch of new problems, of course, but that's okay. This is why we're here. Mm. Thank you very mm. much for that. That was mm. quite helpful. Mm. Thank you for the question. You truly, it's a gift. The question's a gift, hey? Like, I actually feel a bit... Um, you know, I'm I'm very much glad to be here and 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 speak with you all, um, but I I don't believe I have anything to say that we can't say better together. And I know that's what we're kind of doing in this format, you know. And and it's 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 an honor really to be able to answer questions. It's a beautiful exercise for me. Um, but I, you know, it it's not. You know, and, and there is some such, such thing as structure, right? You know, there's a few people in this chat now. And so it's, you know, if everybody is to talk, we have to arrange right, basically to do this over like six hours, you know. Um, so there is, there is something to be said for, for that. Um, but genuinely, I know how much people who are interested in this stuff have to offer. Um, yeah, I, I really do. So I'm just I'm grateful to have the opportunity to talk. That's all. Well, we're grateful to have you. I just have a, a, a couple uh, last questions. Are you good on on time? I know we're we're a little longer than we. Uh... Absolutely. No, no, no. I I can. I'm here. I'm all good. So hey Tim. Oh, go ahead. Brett, can I... Yeah, go ahead. I uh, I've listened to a few of your conversations and I'm listening to the one now and I, I really appreciated it. I... I, yeah, man, thank you. Well, of course. And um, so I, I guess the most direct question I could ask and one that may be a little more productive in terms of um, generating some pragmatic um, stuff to discuss is what, what can we do together? What can we collaborate on? Right? What, what is it that we can do in this space with not just with our words, but um, what is it that we construct virtually here that will lead us to perhaps even adjusting the physical places in which we live that will bind us together, not just in um, disparate and distant words, but also in, in close and proximal um, loving relation, right? Like this is mm. stuff that I'm interested in too. So yeah, mm. has your mind um, touched on any of that stuff? Have you, have you, what is it that we could do to get yeah, man. I mean, every, every fucking day. Um, because this stuff has always been grounded for me and how can I actually like create something valuable enough which becomes co-create something valuable enough that can actually sustain me to continue to do things <laughs> and to continue so yeah I mean it's it's the question um so here I kind of feel drawn to say some things that I hope we can um you know ask for some a bit of charity regarding um because i've been thinking about what it is to to sort of build community and how i can do that ethically and um what kinds of things i want to build and where they're going to take place for a long time um and i've thought about discord and i've kind of realized that the discord environment is feels to me kind of kind of a bit saturated you know there's the portal there's this discord there's um the rebel wisdom one and um i realized that in my own work my own self i haven't been able to create something that's a strong enough attractor to um 
have a kind of organic let's say community develop around the kinds of things i was doing so then i have to make a decision about well what stuff can i kind of drive myself or what communities can i involve myself in and over the last few months i've been building a website called voicecraftcollective.com and that is a network that um you can join and it's got it's built on mighty networks so you can create groups in there and the private groups secret groups that it's basically like a social media type channel you can you know organize events and post articles and share things and um i'm what i'm doing is with a big portion of my time building relationships slowly with people who are interested enough interested enough to with me um, coordinate places in time coordinate structures where certain inquiry inquiries can be deepened so there's a website called egp.community the ephemeral group process my sense is that the egp process mixed with dialogos um, will enable the deepening of questions which can be tracked and offered as gifts to other communities um, and offered to the world um, and then the dialogus component offering you know, just being basically meaningful dialogue together enabling a different kind of working through these themes and concepts um, will enable a group of people say between six but maybe even up to like a hundred maybe more and have break off into groups of maybe six and undergo processes of inquiry which end up extracting synthesizing rather questions which then become further objects of contemplate contemplation and that process continues to deepen and then we've gone on a four to six or eight week journey with each other and over the course of that time we've had a number of conversations we've tracked a bunch of questions and well now we see where we are so the idea would be and that's the idea with egp which you can read on the website is that these are processes that communities local and digital can engage in to help bring the full complexity of cognition that they have to offer um to be able to ask better questions do the problem formulation better and through that question asking you know answers will come um and maybe collaborations of you know actuating things in the real world happen maybe they're about how do we solve particular problems in the real world depending on the group of people gathering already so i'm kind of what well, i'm thinking personally is that i basically want to attract you know um extend the invitations in a kind of esoteric way to some number of hundred people hundreds of people probably not more than a few thousand to participate in a network where um different inquiries are gone on that might that also bring in that might be in response to kind of conversations had by people that are already gathering attention um in the space so you know john guy or you know plenty of people um that seek to um deepen the inquiry and then also understand well who can really add a lot of value to this discussion and how can we bring them in how can we something i call the sacred art of invitation making how can we invite people to participate with us and have that invitation be evocative of that same integrity that we commit ourselves to holding in that dialogue in that space in this space together now how can we create invitations that resonate with that sort of integrity such that people will want to come along and add what they can so basically how to coordinate 
community inquiry and to in those processes um um figure out how to and i've got some ideas about this there's so many there's so many aspects of this because it's kind of like a schematic for um building a community that allows people affords people the opportunity to really develop their capacity to listen to perceive and to express and to genuinely involve themselves in the directionality of inquiry and then to create artifacts through that which can be shared with others which are helpful and maybe it's not maybe sometimes the artifacts aren't created that's fine um but yeah just a kind of it's 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 so nebulous it's really just a, a right relationship of communication forrest said to me that one of the fundamental problems is that we just don't spend enough time communicating and that communities looking to build they need to spend about a third of the time just in conversation like good quality conversation um and there's just not enough time put into that often so really it's a matter of coordinating time um and you know and then obviously resonating in the right way um so my hope is that in sort of inviting people to join me in the journeys of inquiry and inviting people to share their creations for you know in the engagement with others along that process that that is so Nora Bateson has a term called mutual learning environment simathesy which is a beautiful term and you know that's got to be part of it how do, how do we create these mutual env learning environments together so we learn as we deepen inquiry and have that matter because well the inquiry is directly relevant to problems of um world making culture building building languages of communication but then um you know, that's one part of it there's a bunch more to say about what i personally think is required in the broader public media space which i actually feel as though what i have to say about that i'm i kind of want to explore it um privately or at least not non-recorded which is kind of interesting right almost goes against some of the things i've been saying but the thing is that ownership of brand of the medium or platform that houses the kind of conversations required i think to um be cathartic and transformative at the level political and social in our time given its fractured nature uh, i don't think i don't think that space can be owned um i don't think it can work if the conversations are taking place in someone's house that they own um i actually think we need to collaborate in basically building a burning man type dynamic of structure um that um recedes once its event occurs um and the only thing that remains is the integrity of relationship established among those who participated and co-created but that the actual structure itself so there's kind of two things like on the one hand I want to participate with people in their own communities in a network I'm building but then I also recognize there's this other thing that has to be built that has not been built anywhere um and that is the kind of thing that I you know you know I pro I've already said quite a bit about that there so well that's awesome it's an interesting I, I one just, you signed up for your your uh your collective uh, website there so um I, I'm I'm fascinated with everyone's minor variation on the theme here that we're all mm. searching for. I, and I think, mm. uh, yeah, I know I'm deeply interested in participating in a lot of it. And I think mm. that we do have a chance here to to have the serious play where we do experiment with um, configurations and ways of getting to know each other and uh, getting to know ourselves, whereby maybe in the future, we can avoid some of the pitfalls that we've discovered over the past 
50 or 60 years of modernity that um, in the integration of ourselves with this technological layer and um, with a hyperabundance of, of all that, that is entailed by it um, mm. and the differential mm. um, uh, accumulation of those abundances, let's say, in the presence of the, the uh, mm. cult. I think all of these things are, are finally at a place where at least the self-interested and drawn can start to really address them, right? So we can finally begin mm. to, and, and I, oh, so yeah, I don't want to lose the idea of this notion that I think the Burning Man thing is key. I think Almost that is done, five minutes. the ephemeral quality of what it I'm takes to time. dynamically self-assemble into, mm. into a collective that has the capacities, right? Distributed amongst mm. themselves that efficiently and functionally um, mm. is it representative of the same things that we need in order to make sense um, at multiple layers here in our in our modern culture and so mm. when you any encourage that um, seems like a good idea yeah yeah I think you're gonna I find mean, a, a lot of a lot of overlap uh, between your what you're doing and what we're doing here so anything you know that we can do to help with that and to coordinate with you and you coordinate with us and uh, yeah, I would love to, to help bring, bring these, yeah. bring us together and, and work together yeah. on this. Yeah. I've got a, a web launching called Metagora, right? This is just, uh, if, if each of these communities is a city on the map, I want there to be as obvious an interstate between those cities as there can be, right? Where yeah. each of them exists. I mean, it's critical. So, yeah. And, and that's really one critical. of the things we've been missing is a is an is easy roadmap to navigate on the the territory of, of of all the knowledge that exists in this in this space so yeah i'm, I'm deeply yeah. interested in bringing with anyone else doing that too yeah it was just a, it was a bit of a i wouldn't say breakthrough but like i you know part We're of the done. journey for me was like right at the beginning like be part I'm, of transformative conversations like bridge making conversations but i i actually don't think at the you know, in, in everyone's community, in everyone's project, you can aspire to those exact same things. Invite people in, have the conversations, share them, deepen things, provide value. Absolutely brilliant. None of that needs to change. Everyone should be doing, right, everyone should be doing that. Everyone, like as much of that as possible is a good thing. But then what, you know, in terms of what that interstate is, like no one can, <laughs> I don't think the interstate can be just another community that's the thing about it because well that's just another community then like what is it to to actually collaborate together among communities to create something where there is that different space that different plane that's what it that's what it looks like and so you know i mean i invite i invite the the contemplation regarding regarding that notion um because that's a that's an interesting one. Um, sending well, out invitations, summonings, oh, fun stuff. Perhaps this is the space of the shaman, the modern day shaman. Um, mm -hmm. I've been playing around with just attaching the notion of the psychopomp to it. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a divestment that has to occur with your identity, right? You have to be willing to shape shift, to, to absorb, to appreciate, to identify with, empathize with the presentation of whatever communal um, aspects are representative of the language that you encounter. And then you have to extrapolate from that the deeper subterranean layers of meaning that everyone has discovered in their ex own experience, right, that represents the truth of the language and the, the culture that's developed there. And then see where that's conciliant across all of these um, smaller organizations of experience. And, and in the process of doing that, I think you're fundamentally transformed into a particular shape, a kind of um, uh, uh, my me mimetically diverse, constantly uh, reconfiguring, you know, dynamically uh, searching criticality. I mean, like you can come up with a million different ways mm -hmm. of trying to mm -hmm. describe this, but it's fundamentally what our brain is doing. It's just this: we, we're 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 doing this, like we're forming this at the cultural layer now, right? That we're absorbing these mm -hmm. cult uh, items and attempting to make not just a narrative, but uh, a methodology for maneuvering through the narrative, right? To, to, to place ourselves in different aspects of it and different perspectives and angles and find out what, what may or may not be consistent across all of it and find the, the true uh, 
connective tissue, let's say. So yeah, yeah, yeah I'm right, I'm right there. Yeah, you. yeah, it's so interesting because it's like a connective tissue, and at the same time, it's for, you know, arguably, it's for a shape that has not been made. That's the thing. It's like in that conversation with Anderson that I recorded the last one on my podcast. It goes into it a bit more in part two, but one of these ideas that has been gripping me for so long is to understand what the emergence of a novel archetype archetypal form would be like can we actually make sense of that idea um because you know obviously nietzsche had the idea of the eternal recurrence of the same but it's like mm, the thing we yeah. and people talk about feeling the elephant i'm like i'm not talking about feeling a fucking elephant we haven't <laughs> you know what i mean it's it might not be an elephant um so yeah well, so I mean, like you can think of it as like space filling, right? Like if you have a cubic volume of space, what is the shape of stuff that can be in there? And then what, what can it, what it can, what it can do, right? So in our age, we're now, we're now understanding what it is to build up more and more complexity from very simple structures underneath, right? And the, the kind of heterogeneous mix of, of different substances with different capacities produces a kind of synergistic output that that it can do more than the sum of its parts. And, and then we have a good conception of something like metamaterials, where further and further um, complexity leads to new configurations and orientations in that volume of space that, it, that the, the material is fundamentally capable of new uh, properties, right? It, it can do new mm. interesting things, as not just extending its prior capacities, but new and interesting things. So yeah, there there is something yeah. there that we that we can't quite grasp yet, and it, it it is probably always the ineffable aspect of novelty that we'll never be able to fully contain within a language or a, a grippable form. But nevertheless, mm. I think we like that is what our calling is as as attentive conscious creatures is to do the transformational process. What what the psychopomp is fundamentally doing is translating from that chaotic realm of potential what is actual, right? mm. what can be, mm. and what configurations are possible with the energy levels that we're, we're gifted with. So I, I just want to jump jump mm. in for a sec. The conversation can continue, but I, I, I'd like to bring the, the official Q&A to a, mm. to, to a close. Uh, so I wanted to thank uh, Tim for being here. This has been fantastic. I want to thank uh, everybody for asking such great questions. This has been a really a great Q&A, and I'm grateful to everyone for being here today. And thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank you. It's been a trip. So thank you, everybody. Uh, so we're going to end, end, end the recording, but uh, obviously you can stay and talk. Uh, tomorrow we've got Layman Pascal coming uh, for a return visit. Uh, so, so please come for that at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, come back Monday. We've got uh, John back for, for a Q&A. So thank you, everybody, and, and have a great night. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Tim. Take care. Yeah, thank you.